Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. My name is Noah DePonte Smith, and I'm the student vice president of the Buckley program. Um, the program is dedicated to the promotion of intellectual diversity on Yale's campus. We achieve this through our speaker events, our debates, our annual conference, our lecture series, and our summer internships through Yale undergraduates. Uh, undergraduates and graduate students interested in learning more about the program or in becoming a fellow should visit our website at buckleyprogram.com. Uh, now for our speaker. Professor Amy Wax is the Robert Muntime Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania uh, Law School and is an expert in social welfare law and policy and civil procedure. She holds a bewildering array of degrees uh, from Somerville College, Oxford, Harvard Medical School, Columbia Law School, and most importantly, Yale College. In the last few months, she's inspired, shall we say, a, a certain controversy uh, at Penn for her writings on relative cultural value and the decline of America's bourgeois culture. Uh, today, she'll be speaking on the role of the family in contemporary American life. At the end, we'll have time for questions, so please raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. Um, the mic is on, it's just recording, it won't make any noise, so don't be concerned. Um, with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Amy Wax. Well, thank you so much for having me. And of course, I always am glad to come back to Yale, which is my alma mater, although I did graduate many decades ago. Uh, I'm going to talk today on the very important topic of what is happening to the family and why. It is no secret that behavior in the realm of family and sexuality has been changing rapidly over the past 50 years or so, with momentous consequences for society and everyone in it. And here I will focus primarily on behavior among heterosexuals, although there is an interesting story for gays, which perhaps we can touch on in the question period. In addition to shifts that have taken place over society as a whole, there has emerged a stark divergence and dispersion in behavior and family patterns by race and class. So I will touch on that as well. What is happening, how can we explain it, and what do these patterns bode for the future of our society? The main structure, family structure changes that have taken place in the past 50 to 60 years concern developments in patterns of marriage, of divorce, cohabitation, childbearing, that is single versus two parent families, and a phenomenon known to demographers as multiple partner fertility. Marriage has been a dominant organizing institution in Western societies for millennia. It has stood at the central of so center of social life, but it is on the wane. The percentage of adults who have ever married has gone from 72% in 1970 to 59% in 2000, with an accelerated decline over the past 17 years. According to Mark Regneris, a Texas sociologist who has recently written a book on the topic that brings together much of the data pertinent here, the percentage of men unmarried at age 34, and that is the age before which most marriage does occur, has increased about 1% per year since 2000, going from 34% unmarried to 53% unmarried. That is a very big change. If the decline continues, at this rate, we will see an effective collapse of marriage as an institution in American society in the next few decades. Of course, the age of marriage has increased on average. More men will marry after 34 in the future, but not enough to make up for this decline. And these figures do hide a broad range of marriage rates by race and class. In fact, marital decline is now mostly driven by the less educated, high school graduates and dropouts, and non-Asian minorities. And here I am talking about blacks and Hispanics. Marriage rates used to be more similar across social classes, now quite a bit lower among the less educated than among those who are college graduates. That is the sort of divide, that is the fault line that has emerged in our society. Male college graduates, especially whites and Asians, still marry at high rates. White males with a BA degree still have a 90% lifetime hazard. I guess that word hazard is interesting. Uh, and female college graduates now have higher rates of marriage than less educated women, uh, which is a new thing. 
There's sort of been a crossover here. Now, marriage rates are significantly lower, closer to about 65% now, but declining for people with only a high school degree or less, and are rapidly lowering among that group. For blacks, the situation is even starker. They have always married less, even net of education, earnings, jobs, and they have always divorced more, but the differences are getting more pronounced. Currently, the majority of blacks in the population will eventually marry, but just barely. And once again, the rates are declining. What about divorce? Divorce rates started to rise in the 50s, 60s, and most importantly, in the 70s. The 70s was the high watermark of divorce rates. That's where the sticky figure of 50% comes from. In fact, that figure is out of date. Today, it is more like 25 to 30% of marriages ending in divorce. But once again, the rates differ by race and social class, with college-educated whites having declining divorce rates since the 1980s, creating a divorce divide. Steve Martin, a Maryland sociologist, reports currently that the white college-educated population now has a divorce rate of around 12 to 15 percent. That's remarkably low. For blacks and working class married couples, the rates are more than twice as high. This is not entirely an age effect. Later marriages are now more common and they are more stable. It is not entirely a selection effect, right? Better marriages because fewer marriages. Rather, other forces are clearly at work. Another observed pattern is that cohabitation has increasingly emerged as a substitute for marriage. This is true in all social classes and groups, but not evenly, once again. Andrew Churlin at Hopkins reports that cohabitation is a particularly unstable short-lived arrangement in the United States as compared, for example, to Europe, which has something that demographers call virtual marriage, that is, people behave as if they're married except for the piece of paper. Here we have what Churlin calls the cohabitation merry-go-round. And this has different patterns and purposes by social class and race. Once again, for educated populations, it has more served as a prelude to marriage for the less educated and those from lower SES status or socioeconomic status. It has become, in effect, a way of life. And among that group, cohabitation produces children more often than before which means a steady and pronounced rise in single parent families and more children not living with both their married biological parents. What about extramarital births? Well, extramarital births were in the single digits in the 1950s and 60s. Now they are close to 40% of all births nationwide. This is not driven by teen pregnancy, by the way. We hear that teen pregnancy rates are dropping, and they are. This is driven by women in their 20s and 30s. Most dramatically, once again, there has emerged a dispersion by class and race. In the 50s and 60s, extramarital births were much lower in all social classes and through all races, although rates for blacks were somewhat higher. When Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote his report on the black family in 1967, the extramarital birth rate for blacks was about 25% which Moynihan found alarming, but which is less than the white overall rate today. Now the rate for blacks is 73%. That is 73% of all black children are born out of wedlock. The class differences are also dramatic. Over 50% of children born to women without a college degree are born out of wedlock. And there is a liminal group of women with some college and extramarital births are rising rapidly among them. But for college graduates, the rate is still only about 8%, one-seventh of that for other women. And for female white college graduates, the rate is lower still, 4%, a tiny figure, a remarkable figure that has bucked trends in the rest of society. For blacks, the high out-of-wedlock birth rate and single-parent families are now the dominant form of child-rearing and family life. Even college-educated black women have a single-parenthood rate that is around 10 times that of similarly-educated white women. For Hispanics, the rate is in increasing rapidly, especially in the second generation after immigration and beyond. 
In 2007, the rate was 38% of mothers. Those are census figures, and once again, growing. Related to this increase in single parent families is the emerging phenomenon of multi-partner fertility. This is the product of extramarital births to the same person, either woman or man, by different fathers or mothers. So a man may have, let's say, children by two or three different women, and some are living in different households, as one would expect. Once again, this is mainly a lower class and minority phenomenon. A paper by a team of researchers at Penn in the uh, journal Demography shows that it's actually unusual for white college graduates, male college graduates, to have children by different partners. Only 7% of men in this category had children by more than one woman, almost all through serial marriage. Right? I think we can conclude that second families for this group are a sort of luxury good. They are very expensive. For less educated individuals and blacks, however, multi-partner fertility rates are much higher and almost all of those births, not all, but almost all, are out of wedlock. Now, Charles Murray, in Coming Apart, has written eloquently about diverging destinies by class. His book is about whites. He leaves aside blacks. But what's interesting about his book is that he goes beyond family formation to consider other aspects of behavior that work in concert with choices about family forms. Right? And these include work, crime rates, geographical separation, drug use, and other habits that have diverged by social class. He notes that well-educated elites have pulled ahead of others, not just in family stability and formation, but in other respects, and have formed almost their own separate society. One of his most striking findings is that, that, is that graduates of elite colleges, who are most likely to be married, stay married, live with biological children during their full 18 years, tend to bunch up in exclusive zip codes and school districts. They have geographically separated from everyone else. His charts show that over 70% of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton graduates from the past 20 years live in the top 15% most affluent zip codes, with 45% living in the top 5% of zip codes. That's an extraordinary degree of concentration. Because they tend to live around one another, these elites thus benefit even more from the collective pro-social family patterns of their class, and their children do as well. That brings us to why do these patterns matter and why should we care about them? As Mark Regneris says, marriage has been a central pillar of societies in many eras, places, nations, and cultures across the history of the world, but monogamous marriage has been a mainstay and a signal strength of Western societies such as ours. Today, marriage correlates with and predicts many positive outcomes, and there is a big literature on this. For men, and to somewhat lesser extent for women, there is better mental health, better physical health, higher earnings, more occupational success, higher levels of reported happiness, more friends, more social connections, more community involvement for married people. Marrieds are also wealthier, and their lives are more stable overall. There are fewer transitions right, in their lives. Marriage is especially important for social support and caretaking as people age, and I think it's very hard for young people like you and students to appreciate this, but end-of-life care is dramatically affected by marriage, and anybody in healthcare, as many of my relatives are, will tell you that. Men who come alone to their medical appointments do not do as well. Social isolation kills. Divorce, the breakup of marriages, compromises all these functions, leaving people on average poorer, more isolated, with more reliance on the government and society to meet their needs. Now, what about single parenthood and multi-partner fertility? Decades of social science confirm that children growing up in single parent homes are at a disadvantage. This is a risk uh, assessment. Mental and physical health, delinquency, drug use and addiction, educational failure, 
and of course poverty are higher in this population, although those other effects are net of income. What are the reasons? Well, we can start with two heads are better than one. Two parents on average provide a more stable environment with better supervision, care, attention, and resources. Also, there are other downsides to paternal lack of involvement, which when you think about it, is really a form of private disinvestment in future populations, right? A half of adults withdrawing or at least providing less attention. Moynihan's insight, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, was that communities with unattached men tend to be less orderly, safe places. Single men, on average, make mischief, and that is reflected in factors such as crime rates, drug use, vandalism, and other elements of the environment. Also, children living with a series of unrelated men as part of this merry-go-round of cohabitation experience a higher incidence of violence and abuse. And that holds true even for married parents. Children in step-parent families tend to do as poorly as children in single-parent families, and worse than if they lived with their married biological parents. It has been observed that complex households that consist of unrelated or partly related siblings and adults tend to create conflict as well as diffusion of lines of authority and responsibility. Who is in charge? Who pays? Who is loyal to whom? Children thrive on order, predictability, and stability. Complicated households are more likely to lack these attributes. Finally, the multiple households that result from multiple partner fertility stretch, uh, cost money and make fewer resources available for each child. So they lose out simply on economies of scale, on dollars and cents. Now what are the explanations for the emergence of these patterns, for diverging destinies, and for changing behavior across class and race? The most popular theory among academics, among academic social scientists who, uh, it will come as no surprise, tend to lean left, looks primarily to economic factors. For blacks, the salient facts are the shortage of marriageable men from crime, incarceration, early death, joblessness. There are fewer men to go around. And this gives even suitable men a marriage market advantage, which it is said they use to delay or forego marriage altogether. For white men, the explanation is a bit different because even working class men appear marriageable and there are high numbers of men in the working class who are working. But even if less educated men are employed, it is contended, they face growing wage inequality compared to the more educated, declines in the type or quality of jobs, more job insecurity, and this leads them to be more reluctant to marry and women more reluctant to marry them. Now, all of this has some surface plausibility and appeal, and clearly economics is part of the story. But there are holes in the purely economic explanations. They don't quite fit the data, especially the longitudinal data, that is, data in which the present is compared to the past, and it's always a good idea to do that. For blacks, even though their unemployment rates are higher than for others, the economic status of black has improved overall over the past several decades, yet marriage rates and stability have steadily dropped. Black men today marry less than black men with equivalent earnings and education in the past. Black men today marry less than white, Asian, and Hispanic men with equivalent earnings and education today. So even black men with a BA marry at much lower rates than, let's say, white men or Asian men with a college degree. Black marriages are down as much among the employed and among the more educated, and out-of-wedlock birth rates are so high that they cannot simply be the product of underclass failure to marry. Right? And if you want to know more about this, uh, a black sociologist named Ralph Richard Banks has written a book called Is Marriage for White People, which sets all of this out, uh, a book that I have, have reviewed. For whites, there are similar defects. Although male-female earnings influence marriage, white working class earning trends explain only a modest portion of the 50-year change in family composition for men and women with a high school degree or less. 
there has been stagnation of wages for high school graduates compared to college graduates and a decline for people without a high school degree. But many demographers contend that is not enough to explain the dramatic declines in marriage. Marriage rates steadily decreased over past decades, even though the wages that working class people have commanded have fluctuated quite a bit. So during the 90s, for example, that was a good time for earnings for high school graduates. And yet, even though men were doing better, their marriage rates were declining. Men with similar characteristics, that is relative earnings, now marry less than in the past. And perhaps the starkest example is back in the 30s or 40s, I know that was a long time ago, when uh, the economy was not doing well at all, and yet marriage rates were higher than they are today. And finally, on a microeconomic level, marriage is still an economically sound choice for people of modest income and education, and in some ways especially for them, because the marginal utility of a second income is higher for people with modest earnings uh, than they are for more wealthy people. Now, of course, this assumes that people are otherwise suitable mates. But that's the problem. There are indicators that men are, in many ways, less socialized behaviorally to marital roles than in the past. And here, Catherine Eden, a sociologist who's now at Penn, her ethnographic work, which is very well known, is relevant. In a book called Promises I Can Keep, she conducted in-depth interviews with a couple of hundred low-income mothers. And she asked them, why don't you marry your children's fathers? These women's complaints were not of men's modest earnings, but of their behavior. Drug use, violence, financial unreliability, criminal activity, lack of ambition, and above all, sexual infidelity. Not the kind of behavior that women want from their husbands. Eden calls this the crummy boyfriend problem. It's primarily a socialization rather than an economic problem, although it is caught up with economics. As we say, it's endogenous. But as others have pointed out, low-income women have their behavioral problems too. For example, they are complicit in the unfaithfulness that single moms complain of, which interfere with harmonious and stable relationship. They effectively poach each other's men. Although much has changed in marital and sexual behavior and norms, the expectation of sexual fidelity and exclusivity for romantic long-term relationships has remained remarkably perdurable and stable. Women expect it, even if today they get it less often. And when they don't get it, that contributes to relationship instability. And I will return to uh, this topic. Now, what about other theories? Very briefly. Once again, the effort to compensate for inadequacies of the pure economics approach has proved remarkably puzzling to demographers. Demographers do see this as a genuine uh, question. Most of the explanations involve a variant on cultural, culture change. Some commentators have noted the evolution to a so-called capstone conception of marriage. So here I'm talking about Catherine Eden, also Kay Heimowitz, uh, and other sociologists. Marriage is now regarded as an institution one enters into after, ha after having arrived, right? Acquiring an education, a steady income, a good job, maybe even a home. Less so, it is regarded as in the past, as an alliance between two people who will start out their life's path together. A relationship in keeping with the social theorist G.K. Chesterton's remark that marriage is not a contract, but it is a fighting team. Together, two people against the world. Adopting the capstone conception leads to a situation where although many aspire to marriage, and indeed they put marriage on a pedestal, and this has been verified by a number of researchers in the field, lower SES people feel they cannot attain it because they can't meet the expectations. Marriage becomes, in effect, a luxury good reserved for the upper middle class. And that is increasingly what we see. Of course, that doesn't explain why we have evolved to a capstone conception, and that question remains open. Some other demographers advance a somewhat different theory. 
known as the status maintenance theory. And here I am speaking of Bob Pollack at Wash U, Shelley Lundberg at the University of Washington. They focus not on why lower middle class people don't get married, but rather on why well-educated people still get married. That's what needs explaining. After all, in an age of free and easy sex, and I'll get to that in a moment, and the growing acceptability of out-of-wedlock child rearing, non-marriage for men, at least, is the path of least resistance. Why take on all that responsibility? Why tie yourself down when you don't have to? Of course, it is interesting here that educated women mostly do still shun out-of-wedlock childbearing. They'll have sex with a man, as opposed to in the past, when they uh, didn't so much, but they still insist on marriage to bear that child. That is a new form of cartel, and so far, largely, they are succeeding in making it stick. According to the status theory, however, all the educated men and women continue to marry and stay married because they know that if their children are to stay at the top, those children need intensive, sustained cultivation. And that is best provided by stable married homes. They know that the competition is greater than ever. The risks, the tensions, and the hazards of life are greater than ever, so they bite the bullet and provide what children need. The flaw here, of course, is that this theory does not explain why people lower down on the SES scale don't adopt these behaviors as an effective way to help their children rise, to climb up the status hierarchy. And in fact, there is evidence that some subpopulations still do believe that and that it works. Witness, witness for example, the pattern among low-income Asian immigrants who scrupulously avoid out-of-wedlock childbearing and stick to traditional patterns and whose children more often improve their, their, uh, their situation in the second and third generation. And all of these trends have been documented by demographers. Then there is the birth control shock theory. And this is really an important one, because I think it explains a lot more than I at first thought it did. This started out as an attempt to explain a paradox. An explosion in extramarital births, as well as abortions, after the mid-1960s, that is, after access to the birth control pill was widespread. So how can that be? There's, there's effective birth control, but out-of-wedlock childbearing is increasing. It just doesn't seem that those two should go together. In their famous paper, George Akerlof, Janet Yellen, now the Federal Reserve Chair, and Michael Katz, argue that effective available birth control destroyed the cartel, the social norm of virginity until marriage, which, of course, not everybody adhered to, but remarkable numbers of people did. This kept out-of-wedlock birth down and marriage rates high. To put it crudely, most men had to get married or engaged to procure a steady supply of sex. Hex sex was a lot harder to get. The birth control pill caused a significant number of women to defect from this cartel, to have sex outside of marriage because the risk of pregnancy went way down and they wanted sex. And this caused the norm of no sex until marriage to fall completely apart. If a woman refused a particular man sex unless he would marry, he would just go down the street and find someone else who would provide it without the marriage condition. But birth control wasn't always used effectively despite its availability. More sex, more pregnancy. But men would no longer marry them because they didn't need to. Shotgun marriage declined. And actually, Katz, Yellen, and Akerlov have amazing data on shotgun marriages just falling uh, rapidly. Some women went on to have the babies anyway, hence the increase in the out-of-wedlock birth rate despite the availability of birth control. And so we saw the steady rise of out-of-wedlock births. Now, a theory I put forward a few years back in a book chapter on the decline of marriage is related to this, but it looks more broadly to developments in the 60s and especially changes in commonly held norms of sexual conduct. Now, there's no question that the pill contributes to these, but I focus more on the changes in the norms. I speculate that the divergence in behavior we see now, mostly by class but also by race, 
is the product of a pronounced moral deregulation that took place in the sexual realm in the 60s. Pre-1960s, there was a uniform and rather strict code of conduct guiding behavior for sexuality and family. This definitely limited people's freedom, but it also reduced the need for individual case-by-case -case judgments. People did not have to self-regulate. They didn't need to decide, how should I behave? They were told. They had a script, and they mostly followed it. And these moral precepts, the simple rules for simple people, which were enacted through stigmas attached to premarital sex, to divorce, to extramarital childbearing, were ironically pretty uniform throughout society. They kept everyone in check more or less, and they operated as an equalizer across class and race. What is so interesting here is that moral deregulation has actually exacerbated inequalities in society. Post-1960s, I speculate, things changed. Well, I know they changed. There was a general moral deregulation known as the sexual revolution. The rules, the social controls were relaxed, and individuals, by and large, had to chart their own path and decide their own course, which required complex individual case-by-case -case judgments. This created room for diverse styles of decision making informed by differences in individual and group specific human capital. That's the sort of expert term. Now, do individuals and groups differ in their decision making styles and capacity? As inconvenient is that, as that is, the evidence suggests that they do. Some people are wiser, better able to assess consequences. Some have more or less self-control. And that might scale up to average differences in social subgroups. Taking off from the work of Richard Hernstein, a Harvard psychologist, I posit that more educated people and non-minorities who tend to be more educated, on average, engage in a more prudent and global assessment of the consequences of their choices and, on average, greater executive function. That is, they are more like to, likely to look in the long term uh, rather than the short term and to curb their behavior accordingly. People who have figured out how to shape their behavior individually and as a group to maximize long-term outcomes for themselves and their children have less need for the prescriptive norms that society used to see to control behavior. And in fact, we see that today, more educated populations, after going through a period of turmoil in the 60s and 70s, have mainly settled into relatively traditional lives. We see that in their demographic patterns. So even if they sow wild oats in their youth, a large number eventually accept relatively stable conventional marriages. They pay lip service to liberation and liberated attitudes, but they don't really show it in behavior. Or as I say, they talk the 60s and they live the 50s. And as a result, their lives and the lives of their children go better. Now, lower middle class people and minorities, Hispanics and blacks, don't show this pattern of behavior as much. Their personal lives are more fragmented and unstable, as I already noted. This could suggest a thinking style. It could suggest projection style. And in fact, there is accumulating evidence of differences by SES, by race, in cognitive style and executive function, the so-called marshmallow test attributes. And some of you may be familiar with the marshmallow test. It's a test that is given to little children, where children are put in a room with a marshmallow and told that if they don't eat the marshmallow until someone comes back into the room, they will get a second marshmallow, right? So it's kind of a, a test for ability to execute and uh, discount rate and all of those good things. Now, there is more evidence about group differences in executive function and thinking style. There is a big study of military personnel with many tens of thousands of people. And it found that in choosing between a lump sum severance pay package and an annuity, more highly educated white and female veterans were more future oriented in their choices by a significant amount. They picked the package with greater overall value rather than immediate payoff. Now, what might cause these differences? Education, of course, is one factor, or at least it is positive as an important factor, right? Uh, upbringing could play a role. The complex jobs that more executive, uh, that more educated people have might foster some of these habits of thinking, 
uh, and self-restraint and self-control. And of course, these patterns are perpetuated through styles of child rearing. Annette Leroux and others have written about upper middle class child rearing patterns, so-called concerted cultivation. And there may be other cultural differences as well. Now some of this, of course, is speculated, speculative, but it is worth exploring. And I think it plays out in other patterns. Take obesity. One of the things I found in doing this paper is that the patterns for family fragmentation by race and class closely track the patterns of obesity by race and class. And of course, 60, 70 years ago, everybody was much more thin than they are now. There has been a divergence in body weight as well as in patterns of family form, right? What I think this does show is that behavioral norms, even if people chafe under them, may serve a useful social function and they may act as an equalizer. Now, some of these insights are related to observations in a recent book by sociologist Mark Renderis, who I originally mentioned. And I want to close my talk by talking about some of his insights and observations in a new book entitled Cheap Sex, catchy title, uh, which draws on a wide variety of social science data. And I think, although it is flawed in some ways, is definitely very thought provoking. He is trying to explain some recent changes in dating markets, which are dramatic, especially the move to this sort of short-term Tinder hookup type sexual encounters, which are something new. In marriage patterns, the pronounced delay and decline that I've talked to you about. And in male behavior. And I'll say a bit more about that. For Regnerus and others who agree with him, it all starts with the birth control pill and the moral deregulation that followed. As already noted, the pill allowed sex without pregnancy risk. This made women less financially dependent on men and allowed them to enter into previously male roles, including jobs. Now, of course, all of this had been in progress, but it accelerated it. It also led women, he says, to relax and even abandon their gatekeeping role of sexual access. Women believed they needed men less, on some level they did, so they provided sex with fewer expectations. Traditionally, women had demanded a certain level of performance and sociability of men uh, as sort of the entree to marriage. Of course, that was the entree to sex. But now, says Regnerus, the market is flooded with cheap sex, casual sexual encounters with no strings attached for men, and of course, porn and the internet have promoted this, he says. According to some demographers, this has coincided with some adverse, unanticipated consequences. First, because men and women have different preferences on average when it comes to relationships, and Regneris takes the case that some of this is hardwired. Uh, feminists may not agree. Women are getting less of what they want, sustain meaningful relationships, while men are getting more of what they want access to lots of sex with little or no long-term commitment or emotional involvement. So he describes a bifurcated market of preferences. Second, there is good evidence that high female expectations for men as the price of sex and the ability to enforce those expectations actually affects men's behavior. Recently, men's behavior has palpably deteriorated. Not you guys at Yale, but let's talk about the rest of the population here. On average, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we can talk about that in Q and A. We, we can talk about that. I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. Um, recently, men's behaviors. Okay, so on average, men are working less hard. The workforce dropout rate among prime age men today is higher than since the Depression. Okay, a demographer named Nick Eberstadt just wrote a book called Men Without Work. Very alarming book. Men are getting less education. They go to college less than women. Many colleges, those below the very top, tippy top of the tier, have a female predominance. It is getting worse. They displace, display less ambition and discipline all around. What are these men who dropped out doing? Nick Eberstadt looked at that too. They're not taking care of children. They're not repairing the home. They're watching video games and movies and playing computer games. They are no longer courting women. 
they have less compunction about cheating on them. Overall, men have become less marriageable and less considerate. But this triggers a kind of downward spiral. Women end up settling for lower standards of behavi behavior and demanding less for sex. This sets up a vicious circle where women provide more cheap sex and men provide less sustained involvement. And indeed, the data indicate that more and more are giving up on marriage altogether. Right? So that's part of what Regneris is talking about here, or at least delaying it indefinitely. Regneris concludes that we are stuck in a kind of dysfunctional prisoner's dilemma with no obvious way out. Our giving up on the social controls that restricted everyone's sexual behavior makes everyone worse off, but especially women, although men as well. But no individual has an incentive to change the situation. And he says, he has a very interesting section on this, women are distressed, their happiness levels are declining, and uh, Justin Wolfers at Michigan and his wife had actually put together a data set about this, but they don't really understand how their individual choices have these externalities. They're making things worse for one another and for men. Right? So collective action really matters in this area. Right? Sexual norms in part obviated the need to understand all of this. They were a kind of collective wisdom that has now been abandoned. Regneris believes, once again, there's no easy answer to the deterioration of the family, and there may be no answer. So I challenge you to think of how we can mitigate and moderate some of these trends that we currently observe. And I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to start with Oy vey, I hope. Queen. Yeah. <laughs> Queen, yes. This is Cooper Moon's Hebrew class. <laughs> Hi, I'm Megan Eiffel. Um, this was a little different than what I expected. I kind of came in here um, thinking, how can I get sort of more insight into some of the relationships I have with other women? Oh. Um, because a lot of my friends, our values line up, sometimes our birthdays line up, but I have these friends that are women for Trump <laughs> that um, have these really conservative views that I was trying to work through. Um, the other piece is, in foundationally, when you were talking about the disparities between blacks and other groups, I think it's important to note that in America, there are really three different groups of blacks. And they often get lumped together. Um, you'll see a newspaper article, black kid gets into all Ivy League schools. Well, when you look, it's a kid in Long Island with a two-parent household. Um, one parent, at least, is from Africa, or there's a, their family is from the Caribbean. It's very distinct to the generations of black Americans, West Indian Americans, and actually Africans, because the experience you described is very unlike most of the experiences of my friends, whether in Queens, Long Island, Texas, Georgia, where their family members are judges, lawyers, doctors, there still is that pressure of you get married, you have one set of kids, if that marriage does not work out, you do not have any additional kids. So I thought that, that this was a great opportunity that could have possibly highlighted that instead of lumping us all together. Because I'm from Trinidad, and that I found typical but offensive, again, that you know I'm lumped in with people that um, have other types of issues. And there are many, many, many of us. 
in those other groups from Africa and the Caribbean that do not have that experience, live here in America, have extended families where we take care of our elderly so that they don't go into nursing homes. Well, I mean, obviously, I am, I am talking on average here. Uh, that is, there is no question about it. This covers a great sort of range. Um, yes, you're right. Uh, there, there is a huge uh, range of behavior in minority communities. And there is this phenomenon of people coming as recent immigrants who display somewhat different behaviors. Um, I, will, I will say this, though. Uh, there are too few of them. I mean, I'm not saying they don't exist, and not at all. Obviously, they do. When I quote the sort of 73% out of wedlock birth rate, uh, that you know tells you in itself something about the predominant pattern. But you know, then there's another 17%, right? So we have to account for them, and obviously, uh, you have accounted for them. Um, so I think you know I am lumping. And there's no question about it, but there is a lot of splitting to do. Now, in terms of you know, the explanations for this, uh, I think there is a cultural dynamic in native-born blacks that affects the great majority of black people. I think that immigrants have, uh, do not exemplify that pattern uh, nearly as much, and that bears explaining. I, I don't stand here with a complete explanation for everything that I see. Uh, so your point is well taken. Now, in terms of, you know, the Trump voter women, uh, I, you're going to have to, you know, I don't know what it is about them that you're uh, objecting to or uh, what do you think they exemplify that needs explaining. I think one answer is they're more conservative, you know, they're more socially conservative. Uh, so once again, the white population runs the gamut as well. One of the paradoxes is that even people on the progressive left among the white population are still behaving in very conventional ways. I mean, that is interesting in itself, right? They are, as I say, talking the 60s, but living the 50s. And uh, some really wise demographers, the demographers I respect, like Bob Pollack at Wash U, they see this as a genuine puzzle that it stands in need of explanation. Okay, so that, that is part of me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd like to ask you about an element in society that I find the greatest difference from the 20th century, it may be totally irrelevant to marriage demographics, but to me the biggest difference, for example, in the 1930s and 40s, you mentioned that the marriage rate was relatively high. Mm -hmm. In those decades, people used the telephone a lot less than they did in the 80s and 90s. There was socializing. Now you can't hardly walk around Yale without seeing a vast plurality of people with their faces buried in their handheld devices. Yeah. Does that have an effect on, because you can hook up easily now? Well, Regnerus, social media, yeah, in his book, does definitely assign a role to the internet in, in a number of respects. He says it, it makes cheap sex even cheaper yeah. because you know it's so easy to connect up with a million partners. Before, you used to have to actually go out and talk to women and sort of chat them up and you know, figure out what they wanted and all of that sort of thing. Uh, so it, he definitely assigns a role. But I think he doesn't really assign the sort of first mover role to it. He, he sees more a, it's more of a facilitator role. Now, what he does do is he has a chapter on pornography, which I haven't talked about. Uh, he says that the... The, porn, the intensity of pornography use has gone through the roof. Some of his figures are truly staggering in terms of the percentage of men who are regularly viewing pornography, uh, even married men. Um, majorities, clear majorities of men are regular users of pornography. And he says this just adds fuel to the fire here of sort of separating people from each other, giving them an excuse not to deal with each other, in the round, so to speak. It's the cheapest form of cheap sex, he says, because, and, and it promotes sort of unrealistic uh, 
sort of dis dissociated visions of sex as sort of separate from personality, from individuals, from emotions. And it sets unrealistically high standards for men that end up contaminating their, their actual relationships. Uh, the other interesting thing is that even liberal women, there are some very interesting differences by, uh, by politics in, in attitudes and behavior. But one that is not very durable is women not liking the fact that men are seeing all this pornography. But what can they do, right? Once a norm tips, women don't have very much power to affect men's behavior. I mean, if you tell this guy that you're not going to continue the relationship unless he stops all this pornography use, you go down the street and the next guy is using it too. So what are you going to do? Right? So this is why it's so important that norms not tip. Once norms tip, it's very hard to move them back. I think we've, we've kind of learned that. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I know you don't. Uh, hi. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, you were. Uh, I didn't get the introduction. You're Professor X. Uh, like, wh where do you teach again? Can you speak up? Yeah. Wh um, wh where do you teach again? Uh, At Penn, what, University of Pennsylvania Law School. What's your position? Uh, you, you're a social scientist. You said. I have a lot of social science training, and I, I write about law and social science. Okay, I was wondering if you've come across Ross Chetty's work, um, specifically uh, the um, Lifetime of the Inventors, where he talks about the um, outcome of you know, economic growth, actually, because of the destruction of the nuclear family, where yeah. kids who actually don't, who aren't in uh, nuclear families, actually face a lot of disadvantages towards other kids who are in um, a higher socioeconomic range. Well, I mean, I think it's well known that kids who are not in two-parent families face disadvantages. Uh, and, and only part of that is economic. I mean, some of it is because kids in two-parent families uh, tend to have more resources. Sometimes they have two parents working. Not always. But, and that makes them better off. So that's very straightforward. But even net of, as we say, net of income. Uh, Well, but what's cause and what's effect? I mean, you know, I recently reviewed a book on upward mobility by Richard Reeves, and he's totally focused on the top 20%. And one of the things I said in my review is, only 20% of people can be in the top 20%. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a ineluctable fact. OK, so if we really are worried about the well-being of society as a whole and children in society as a whole, we can't rescue people by saying, well, they need to be upwardly mobile. Right? That's just not a blueprint for a country. What we need to do is ask ourselves, how can children in all social classes be better off? And one of the ways that they used to be better off, and I'm not minimizing the hardships of the past, life is hard is their families were more organized. You know, men were expected to take responsibility for their children, for better or worse. And that is not a scarce good, you know? I mean, being in the top 20% is a scarce good. But having a father who cares, the fact that one person has that doesn't prevent another person from having it. that were actually, were if, if you accounted for specific places like Utah, for example, where the Mormon church exists, that you actually saw these kids make it to the top 10%, and Utah had a, you know, a much more vibrant economy than these other places. Right. Well, no, I'm not denying that children in, in the lower quintiles who have an intact family have a better chance of being upwardly mobile. I'm not denying that. All right, that, that I think is well documented. Um, that that sets the predicate for better development of human capital. But that's sort of a, a well-known finding. The other finding, I think, that Raj Chetty, uh, this is from Raj Chetty, um, is that kids in single-parent families who grow up in communities that are mainly two-parent families do better. So the surrounding social milieu also affects children even in more adverse situations. Now, this is just this collective tipping type effect that, you know, that we are familiar with and often ignore. 
to our peril, what other people are doing matters to how well you do. Yeah. First, thanks for a great oh, presentation. I'm sorry. Well, she'll be. Okay. I'm not very good at this. It's okay. I'm wondering if you've found a relationship between the entrance and success of women in the workplace mm -hmm. and decreasing marriage rates. Yeah, that's very interesting because it really depends on the era. Now, if you go back far enough, you know, you go back to the early part of the 20th century, there was something called blue, a blue stocking. Women who went to college were not considered desirable mates. They were, they were these, you know, pointy-headed intellectuals. That meant that their uterus was shriveled and all of that. Uh, although they did marry, but they married at much lower rates. So you married a woman of your social class, but she wasn't necessarily as well educated. There was less assortative mating by education, although obviously there was a lot of mating by social class. Um, so that was then. But around 1985, 90, I don't know the precise year, there was something called a crossover, which was that educated women started having higher marriage rates than women who were less educated. Now that's interesting. So education no longer was considered undesirable in a woman. In fact, quite the opposite. There was women's, women's education became sort of like a status item. You know, men wanted women who were well educated. There was more assorted of mating. Um, two incomes became more important. I think this whole concerted cultivation of children, the idea that a more educated mother would be a better mother, um, all of these ideas, and then the companionate ideal of marriage also became increasingly important. It's always been there, but now it's sort of the paramount concern that you're marrying your best buddy and the person who shares all your interests, likes your music, has the same Pandora playlist, and all of that sort of stuff is going on. So it's changed with time. Thanks. Thanks for a very informative presentation. I'd be very curious for your thoughts about potential solutions to this dilemma of norms that support a culture of marriage, particularly two avenues of that. One is the, the great utility of our religion and faith communities, faced, of course, by a very secularizing age, the kind of things Mary Ebbestout writes about. And secondly, the proposals of Charles Murray at the end of Falling Apart, that those who most live by those ideals are less than ever advocating them which weighs lastly into an experience I'm sure you're familiar with, that when folks advocate for bourgeois virtues, the response is, who are you to lecture us? Right, well, it's even worse than that. Uh, they <laughs> Oops. Um, well, religious communities, very interesting. Obviously, there are some fundamentalist type uh, religious communities, and by saying that, I, I mean no disrespect at all. I, I come from a very devout Jewish family. Um, that have been pretty good in enforcing sort of the expectations uh, that, you know, go along with uh, being uh, sort of hawkish on these things. But what Regneris says, Regneris is actually an evangelical, and he says there has been a shift in American society from religion as, you know, imposing social controls to religion on a more therapeutic model of accepting people as they are, of not judging people, uh, of, you know, it's, it's kind of bought into this greater cultural trend of tolerance and non-judgmentalism, of different lifestyles. And so religion has proved to be a fair um, disappointment in terms of uh, promoting this marriage culture. Now, it hasn't, you know, completely failed, obviously, but it hasn't had as much of an effect as was hoped. And this is I think one example of this is the black church. The black church has not really been able to stem some of these trends, even among people who are professedly religious and do attend church. They still exemplify the, tr the social trends of the dominant social trends around them. And white evangelicals, I think, is kind of a, a it's a, a liminal, it's a dynamic situation. It's really unclear. Uh, how good they will be in continuing to enforce this. I'll tell you, the Catholic Church has not been very successful. 
Um, so the church is, is a bit of a disappointment. In terms of practice, uh, preaching what you practice, forget it, all right? I mean, judgmentalism is among sort of the progressive elite upper classes. It is just not fashionable. It's all kind of, you know, this is our lifestyle. This is what we choose to do. Now, of course, we're making out ban like bandits for do by doing it. Our children are. Uh, but we're not going to tell you what to do. Uh, I have not seen a change in that ethos. I mean, I wrote a, an op-ed about bourgeois values that got me <laughs> savaged. I mean, which I found almost comical, you know, as a case study in what happens if you get out there and say, you know, there's this script, which by and large and on average, if people follow it, they do somewhat better. I mean, that's considered an outrageous thing to say. Uh, go figure. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I was wondering if you had, if you've come across any interesting observations on uh, maternity leave and family life, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. even though there are more women in uh, who are getting educated and enrolling in, um, you know, higher level positions in the workplace mm -hmm. um, by number, I'm wondering if um, that affects family life, given that there is no uh, clearly defined federal policy for maternity or even family parental leave right. um, and how that affects the, it, uh, the family and marriage as an institution? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I'm kind of of two minds about it. On the one hand, you know, as kind of a conservative by disposition, I'm very suspicious of government mandates, growth of government and programs, right? So there's that, so I'm a little wary of that. But on the other hand, I think that there is now good evidence from international data that countries that are more flexible in terms of labor markets and providing supports for families actually have stabler families and higher birth rates. Um, it's interesting, the Daymore, uh, the Daymore flap at Google, so this guy James Daymore got fired from Google because he opined that it was not realistic to expect that women would be equally represented in STEM or at the top of STEM. And Ross Doubtett, who's actually lecturing today at Yale, wrote a column that I thought was the best column. I mean, what's interesting to me is people blogged like crazy about this. Most of them were men, of course. Um, and just uh, blog, blog, blogged about it. But Ross Doubtett wrote something very wise. He said, OK, Google is sort of virtue signaling about women's equality and feminism. But here's something that the uh, Silicon Valley companies are not doing. Amazon has spent tens of millions of dollars on a lifestyle center, no daycare center, right? They're blind. He said they, they're missing the forest for the trees. They don't get it. They don't get what will really help women, what would really help women integrate work and family. Now, let me just comment internationally. So the two countries that have the lowest birth rates in the world, the West, the, well, the world entire, are Japan and Italy. Isn't that weird? Two completely different countries. Why do they have the lowest birth rates in the world? This is what demographers are trying to figure out. And here's their theory. They're very rigid in work and family roles. So women either have to go to work full time, flat out, be like a guy, there's no part-time work, there's no flexibility. Or they have to stay home and be a mom and be a wife, and the men never do a darn thing at home, right? They want to be waited on hand and foot. So the women are caught in a dilemma. A lot of them are electing to go to work, but that means the birth rate is just, you know, falling into the cellar. And what we learned from that is that countries like the United States, which oddly enough is highly flexible even if it's not very supportive, or countries like Sweden, Northern Europe, France, France has actually done very well by this, uh, that provide supports for motherhood but also uh, facilitate women working or working part-time, maybe not full-time, but in some capacity, they 
they, their families tend to be more stable and they do keep their birth rates up. So I think there is some role for it, actually. Thank you. You mentioned that once the norms go away, it's very hard to bring them back. Um, and seeing as we're probably not on the eve of any kind of resurgence of 1950s sexual morality, I'm curious if you think that there are any conceptual resources within modern secular culture that could somehow be modified slightly to ameliorate, if not entirely fix the problem. Is there anything kind of in our cultural logic right now that actually might be able to bring us out of this? Well, first of all, there are pockets of the 1950s, as I said, and they're called upper middle class, you know, people. They, they are living the 50s, oddly enough, even though they're, you know, they're not living the premarital sex span. They're, they've modified the 50s, but ultimately, once they get married, uh, they're pretty conventional. Um, Really what you're asking is, how can we bring that more widely to society? I am very pessimistic about it. Uh, I think one problem is it feeds on itself. So take single parent families. David Autor at MIT, who's a very good demographer, wrote a report called Wayward Sons. And what it showed is that men who grow up in single parent families are not very well socialized compared to men who grew up in two-parent families. So they end up perpetuating the cycle in the next generation, right? They're not very desirable as mates. They don't treat their women very well. They're less responsible. These are you know, averages, obviously. They run a gamut. But he's talking statistically. So it, there is this kind of downward spiral that is occurring. I think the other problem is, and I am very critical of elites, I think elites are very selfish. And they'd rather be politically correct and not tell anybody else what to do uh, and live their lives and act like they're incredibly open-minded and tolerant and supportive of people who, you know, diverse lifestyles. The watchword is diversity, right? The buzzword. Diversity. We have to be tolerant of diversity. We have to value diversity. And at the end of the day, they're not doing anybody any favors. Believe me, they're not, because the government cannot hold you harmless for this stuff. It just cannot. The ideology is we have enough services and programs. We just need more services and programs. And if we only just have the right services and programs, and if we throw enough money at the problem, then we can hold people harmless for the fact that they don't have a father. Now, I am sorry, but the government cannot substitute for a father. Those of you who have fathers, you know that, that day to day, that minute by minute that care, that oversight, that concern, that personal relationship, the government cannot supply it. So that is a myth. And it's a myth that is regularly indulged. You know, you go to your sociology 101 class, and I think that is what you hear, unless you want to quarrel with that. Got time for one more. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I'm, a, I'm from a single parent uh, household and a low income family, and I can personally attest to most of the observations that, that you, know, you and many other so sociologists have made. Um, and I know that my mom is a kindergarten teacher and has seen generations of kids who, you know, all the kids in her classes, it was, it was a low income school, the ones from single parent homes would generally do you know, much worse and have problems and later on in, in their school life as well compared to the lower income but two parent households. Um, and I think. So I think that, I mean, the data seems indisputable to, and it, it, it's, you know, I think impossible to disagree with it. But as you pointed out in, you know, the elite world, in the classrooms, that seems to be where the, the argument is slipping. Um, and it seems that, you know, just for Yale as an example, if on the student level, if you dare suggest mm -hmm. to anyone that, you know, hookup culture might not be a good thing, that two-parent homes might be a better thing than a one-parent home, you are, end up you're caught in you know a whirlwind as you yourself experienced at UPenn. You know of uh, I have tenure though. You have, yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that doesn't mean it hasn't been a whirlwind. But but it you know for they, 
just last uh, last year though, I got in an argument with someone in a dining hall that. Uh, where I fell on one side of the issue, coming from, again, a single-parent home saying, right. listen, this is a progressive measure mm -hmm. that is equalizing. It helps lower-income people. It helps disadvantaged people. Um, and ended up in a you know, weeks-long dispute with many people, many other friends, others, who all called me you know, I mean, many terrible things. You know, it was, it was, and we've seen it in op-eds, too. Anytime uh, someone suggests, again, that any of these norms should come back, uh, you know, it's, you're met with vitriol, you know. So what, what do you think could be the, the persuasive, what, what will be, what is the persuading uh, point for an elitist who doesn't, you know, understand or won't um, consider that the measure is actually progressive? It seems yeah. deeply ironic and, it, and yet... Well, I have no ready answer for you. I think we are in a horrible moment of orthodoxy today that is uh, very detrimental. I'm, I'm a little bit pessimistic about it. You have to develop a thick skin. You have to arm yourself with data. You have to do a lot of homework. It's very, very hard work. As Oscar Wilde said, it takes too many evenings. Uh, this, is, this is a problem. Uh, but I will say to you that there are some things that you can say. I, there are some things that I have worked out that I think help to at least stop people from you know, continuing with this line of argument, which is really counterfactual. By the way, the fact that the facts support you doesn't mean a darn thing in the face of ideology, right? So for example, people will say to me, and when I went to Middlebury, someone said this to me, inevitably, I'm from a single parent family and I turned out great, right? So what are you talking about? And I say, well, consider the following argument. I'm from a poor family. I turned out great. Ergo, we don't need to worry about poverty. We don't need to worry about people being poor. That's the argument that they're making. Right? The fact that I, this one person, turned out great means that we can just forget about it. But we can't forget about it because anecdata is not data, or it's not all about you. It is not all about you. It is about other people. And frankly, I think that that is, I, I hesitate to mention the man at the top who has so many flaws, we could be here all day. But one thing I think that he has done is he has invited us to remember the forgotten man, right? The people we don't live with, the people we don't know, the people we don't socialize with, the bottom 80 percent, right? Those people deserve our concern and our solicitude. They are our fellow countrymen. They are our fellow citizens. We live with them. We bear some responsibility towards them. And so I don't think that you know, peop your friends, whoever they may be, and I've certainly experienced this, uh, they think they're doing people a favor. They certainly feel better about themselves by saying these things, but they're really not. Now, I understand the concern with not stigmatizing people. I don't happen to share it. I don't think that stigma is necessarily a completely negative force. I don't think people regretting what they've done or feeling bad about themselves is something that we should banish from society. Right? Regret, feeling bad about yourself, being sorry that you took a certain course rather than another, right? regretting your choices is and always has been considered an impetus to self-improvement, right? A spur to self-improvement. We have reached a point, a bizarre point in our society where no one can ever feel bad about themselves about anything except maybe white males like Weinstein or something. <laughs> and he has to feel bad all the time. I mean, there are selective people in our society. We want them to definitely feel bad. And I'm not making light of that. I am just saying that victims should, people that we put in the victim category should never feel bad. And that, I think, is, is dysfunctional. And of course, you know, victim, so we're, we're creating an incentive to pe for people to make themselves out to be victims. I really don't think that's healthy. Uh, but yet I see that as the trend uh, that we are encouraging. Yeah.